Once upon a time, fairy tales were reserved for bedtime stories when you tucked in your kids at night. But now, fairy tales, such as evolution, are printed as fact in school books. How did we get there? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about right and wrong thinking. And it's coming up next as Arkansas Live starts right now. Thanks for joining us all this week as we continue our teaching on right and wrong thinking. Now, yesterday as we closed, I was reading out of 2 Timothy chapter 4. And Paul says in the last days in the apostasy, uh, people will turn away their ears from the truth and should be turned to fables. That's today. We're seeing this right now. Don't tell me what the Bible says. I don't want to hear the truth. Tell me what makes me feel good. Tell me what will, um, how would I say, confirm what I want to hear, what I want to know, what I want to do. It says they'll be turned their ears from the truth and be turned to fables or fairy tales. Then he tells us what to do. Watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Now, let's go back over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and let's read verse 11. What's wrong with wrong? And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Uh, in Romans, it talks about a reprobate mind, a mind void of judgment. Here, he uses the word delusion. Now, the, the qualification for all this, the qualification for a reprobate mind is void of judgment, uh, delusion, delusional times, delusional thinking, is because people um, have rebelled against authority and sound doctrine. They've rebelled against what's right and they have accepted uh, what's wrong. They just believe anything they see, hear, or read. They believe the wrong thing. Why would you want to believe the wrong thing? Because it supports what you want to believe, what you like or it supports your fantasy or your carnality or your, uh, you know, fleshly desires. So you believe what you want to believe and it's wrong, but yet you believe it. And God says, I'm going to turn you over to the spirit of delusion because that's what you want. And you're going to believe a lie. You believe the wrong thing and you're going to have a reprobate mind which is a mind void of judgment. Have you ever wondered why our politicians and our policy and all these things are in such a mess? It seems like the right hand don't know what the left hand's doing. It seems like they're calling good evil and evil good. <laughs> and you think, what is wrong with these people? It's because, according to Romans 13, they have stiff-armed God. They say, God, we don't want you anymore in our classrooms. We don't want you anymore in our government. We don't want you anymore in our society. So God says, okay, figure it out for yourself. And they can't. They don't have the answers. They don't know how to control violence. They don't know how to control uh, 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 the uh, Spirits of murder, rape, robbery. They don't, they don't know how to solve the problems in education. They don't know how to solve the poverty problems. I think I was watching a young man on uh, CB, uh, on uh, VTN on the 700 Club the other day, and this young man has written a book, The Things They Don't Want You to Know. And he, he quoted some of the figures and facts, and I think it, I may get the figures wrong, but it, it said like there are 58,000 people or even more, maybe a half a million, but 50, let's just say 58,000 people that are receiving government checks that are on, quote, welfare that are dead. <laughs> they don't, they're not alive. They don't, they're not living. But somehow through manipulation or whatever or ignorance or, uh, you know, red tape, every month, 
these people that have died are dead are getting welfare checks, entitlement. That's a mind void of judgment. How do we fix it? <laughs> Nobody knows. How do we fix climate change? Nobody knows because you can't fix climate change. Climate changes have taken place for years, generations, and they'll continue to take place. If you've ever been out in the woods or in the country at any length of time at all, you'll notice that things change. Weather changes, forests change, rock changes. I mean, there's still, there's still as much ice in the, on the planet as always has been and needs to be. Well, then you say, Pastor Cole, why, why would anybody suggest that we get rid of fossil fuels and man's created all these problems with automobiles? Why would they suggest that we've got climate change? Money. Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. You could say it this way. The love of money is the root, the source of all wrong thinking. Now that brings me to another point. And I don't know whether you're making the identification here or not. <clears throat> Poverty. Poverty is a mindset. It's a way of thinking. It has nothing to do with money. That's why our politicians, community leaders, everybody, including from a president on down, Lyndon Johnson, he, de he declared war on poverty. Hadn't changed one thing, nothing in all these years. Spent more money, got no results. He tore down the projects, built new ones. You can't fix, solve poverty with money because poverty is not money. It's not about money. It's about a way of thinking. It's about right and wrong thinking. I wish we could get our politicians. I, I, if there's any politicians, Arkansas state legislature, national politics, if there's anybody watching, <clears throat> you can't solve poverty with money. Money is a way of thinking. It's wrong thinking and it's cyclical. It's perpetual. It's generational. There is one solution in the Bible that Jesus gives us to solve the poverty problem. But nobody wants to hear it, much less do anything about it. Jesus said in Luke 4, uh, beginning with verse 18, He, God, hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's it. That's the, <laughs> the great truth. That's the solution to the problem. It's not money. It's preaching because the gospel carries its own power. The preaching of the gospel to the poor, the good news of what God has provided, what God has done, what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, everything that God has provided there's no shortage of money. There's no shortage of wealth. But you've got politicians that are spending that money, throwing it, flushing it, just, you know, wasting it. Just, you know, think about it. Incorporate the scriptures. There's, there's not a money problem. You can't fix poverty with money. You have to preach the gospel to the poor. That's the Bible solution. That's God's way. You teach them first who God is. You teach them that God's a good God and wants to bless them and has blessed them. You teach them to tithe the first 10%. You teach them to, to learn the laws of sowing and reaping, seed time and harvest. And your poverty problem solved. You don't have to appropriate billions of dollars and waste it. 
It's just, just, like, just like abortion. Abortion is the waste of human lives. Just recently, a doctor turned, uh, what would you call, state's witness for the pro-life uh, group, said he performed 50,000 abortions in his medical career. He killed 50,000 people legally. Never spent one day in jail. Never was arrested. He's a murderer. He killed 50,000 babies in the womb. And he said, and some were out of the womb. They just killed them after they were born. Now you talk about right and wrong thinking. How are you going to stop that? You can't legislate it, just like the gun situation. You can't legislate through a gun lobby to stop criminals or stop mentally imbalanced people from getting guns and shooting and killing people. You can't pass laws. You have to stop it right here. Um, if you've ever been to real poverty, it's heartrending. I've been in the, some of the places like India and Africa and Sri Lanka and different places that are still undeveloped nations and the people are just, or are, are countries where they have a dictator that keeps them poor, kills them, lives off of them. It's heartrending to see people living like that. Or just, just drive from L.A. airport uh, through Tent City, see the people living on the street, urinating, feces, rats. Now leprosy has crept back into the culture because of the filth that's, Leprosy really springs out of filth. And now they, they don't know what to do about it. God does. If we bring God back in the culture, I heard, uh, what, what is her name? Uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s niece. She, they asked her one day <laughs> on a live interview, they said, what do you think the, the solution, do you have any solutions for our cultural problems, our societal problems? She said, sure, it's easy. Put God back in the culture. I mean, people know that, people that are students of the Bible, born-again believers, Christians, people know the answer, but, but the politicians don't, community leaders don't, and they're afraid. They don't know what to do. Oh, well, let's form a committee. Let's appropriate more money. It, that, that doesn't do it. That, that old dog don't hunt no more. You're not going to solve any of those problems. You start preaching the gospel to people and the power of God goes into operation. You start preaching the gospel to the people and, and God will take care of the poverty mindset. First, see, that's the first thing you got to do. You got to get rid of that poverty mindset. Then you can get on with your programs if you want to. But you've got to change the way people think. Right now, we have created over the years, actually, it probably started back with Roosevelt, uh, the entitlement society culture. But whoa, we are highly developed in it now. Something for nothing. Everybody. You know, Roosevelt said we're going to put a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. That's back in the 40s. He's going to solve the problem of lack of joblessness. The government's going to do it. The government never came up with a creative idea in its life. Have you ever tried to get in and out of a government hospital, a government postal office? Have you ever tried to do anything that the government's had anything to do with? They don't have the answers. Government is not your source. Government was not ever designed to be your source. God is designed to be our source. But you've got to get the leaders to at least give God a chance and preach the gospel to these people. Get them delivered from that poverty mindset. Quit recycling the poverty generations one right after another, one right after another, one right after another. You know, in the Dust Bowl, if you've ever seen those documentaries are made about in the Dust Bowl, uh, you, you know what? You know what created the Dust Bowl. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about, but go back and study 
uh, Google it, pull it up, the Dust Bowl. Uh, in the plains, the states in the plains, Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, what they, what they uh, started doing that was wrong is when they started developing the tractor and the plow, man no longer had to plow behind a mule one fur at a time. Uh, a man could pull 16 blades of, of uh, toil, uh, of soil uh, turnover behind a tractor. So they plowed up the whole, <laughs> the whole prairie and the prairie grasses were what held the soil down. And so they plowed up the prairie, planted crops, took all the grass and everything out, and then no rain, and all of a sudden, whew, the wind comes along and starts burying houses and cars in sand, in dirt, in dust. Smothered people to death, smothered their crops. Crop failure, then the Great Depression. And so, you know, I, I saw where one family was going to, you know, leave their home in Oklahoma and they were going to walk to California. And somebody told them, says, you don't need to walk. You'll never get there. It'll take you months and months and months. He said, you just need to learn how to ride the rails. So they did. They started riding the rails, the boxcars, and got there in just a few days and a few weeks. And then they went to work in one of the, you know, fruit picking, vegetable picking uh, farms. Roosevelt promised a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Entitlement. And boy, have we perfected that. We have perfected that today to the nth degree. Even, even illegal aliens, immigrants from other nations can come here and get on the welfare rolls without even being citizens. We can't turn them away. Why? It would be intolerant. It would be intolerant to turn somebody away. When the Lord told me to watch out for that word tolerance, he said, you're going to see it used as a kind of a catch-all phrase, and it's going to become binding, and it's, and it's going to become legalistic. And, and everybody that, you know, criticizes us says, well, you Christians ought to be more tolerant. Jesus was tolerant. Not to sin, he wasn't. He told the woman caught in the act of adultery. He said, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. He didn't say it was okay for her to commit adultery. He didn't say sin was okay. He wasn't tolerant of sin. Jesus called wrong, wrong, and right, right. And we're going to have to start doing that again and not be afraid or fearful of being criticized or condemned. Okay, <clears throat> go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Here is a bigger reason that we should call wrong, wrong, that we should do the right thing. 2 Corinthians, and let's look at chapter 4. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and let's look at verses 3 and 4. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to those that are lost. Now, Jesus said in Luke 4, 18, he said, I've, an, I've been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Here it says, if the gospel be hid. Now, the gospel, according to Romans chapter 1, is the power of God. So you could say it that way. If the power of God is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. It's hid to those that need it the most. How in the world could we ever think that preaching the gospel to the poor would get them out of their poverty? Because there's power that is created when you preach the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, of who he is, what he did, is the power of God unto salvation. You get them saved. You get filled with the Holy Ghost. You teach them the Bible. You preach to them. What happens? They get delivered. They don't think wrong anymore. They start thinking right. 
If you think right, you act right. If you think wrong, you act wrong. You, you just do a little poll. Maybe you can do it with family and friends. Just take a little poll and ask people. Say, uh, why, why do you think that is wrong? Or why do you think that is right? And get them to explain why they think something's wrong and why they think something's right. I guarantee you very few of them will use biblical scripture to stand on. They'll tell you something they read, something they heard on TV, something they watched, something they experienced. But very few of them will tell you what the Bible says because they don't know what the Bible says. So if you start preaching the gospel to them, they get saved. And, and, and listen to what Paul said to the Corinthians. He said, if the gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Did you hear the other day where and you can watch all of this on VTN 700 Club every morning at 11 and every afternoon at 4.30, 700 Club News, CBN News. We give you the news that's not biased. We give you the news that's biblically referenced. But did you hear the criticism? And I don't remember what newspaper or news source criticized them, but it's, it's pretty standard. Here, here, President Trump goes to the United Nations and he skips the conference on climate change and delivers an address about religious persecution. He is, he, <laughs> you don't know this, but there are people martyred for their faith in Christ every day all over the world. Hundreds and thousands of Christians are being martyred, beheaded, put in jail, shot, killed, for their faith and he wants it stopped. So he's going to say no more religious persecution in America or in the world. And one of these so-called newspapers said they criticized him. The media criticized him for not attending the conference on climate change, instead dealing with religious persecution. Now you can, you can see nobody wants to hear about religious persecution. Oh, but we got to stop that, you know, fossil fuel. We got to stop that coal production. We got to stop that oil and gas. We got to stop all of that. But it doesn't matter if people are being killed for their faith. Okay, let's move right on. I've got off my soapbox now. Um, he says, if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. They're the ones that need it the most. Listen to this in whom the God of this world, that's Satan, the God of this world hath blinded the minds, what are we talking about? Right and wrong thinking. Blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And here, the oversimplification of what happens. When you preach the gospel to somebody, the light and the power of that glorious gospel shines, illuminates to them, and they see. They see the truth. They see what's right, and they see what's wrong. I had a friend that was saved, born again, down south Louisiana. He was a druggie. He got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, but he kept smoking marijuana, kept doing drugs, and one of his friends said, man, why are you still doing those drugs? Don't you know that's wrong? He said, it is? I said, yeah, you need to quit that. He said, okay. And he quit. And they asked him later after he got delivered, they said, why, why did you keep doing that? He said, I didn't know it was wrong. Nobody told me it was wrong. Well, do, do you know it's wrong to steal, kill, commit adultery? Do you know it's wrong to rob, to murder, rape? Do you know those things are wrong? How are people going to know what's right and what's wrong if you don't tell them? And this, this example that I read, you know, to you at the beginning of the week about this mother that was confronted with transgender ideology and they asked her how she was raising her kids, a little boy and a little girl. And she said, in the morning when they get up, I ask them how they feel and if they feel like a boy or girl, opposite sex, then I just treat them that way all day long. That mother is, is insane. 
that mother is going to create a basket case that's going to wind up in an institution or, or in a ditch somewhere. Why can't she just go in there and tell that little boy, if he says, I feel like a girl today, she sits down and says, well, darling, you're not a little girl. You're a little boy. And you're going to be a boy the rest of your life. And she reinforces his biological gender. Same with the girl. But parents won't do that. They're either stupid. They're either willfully uh, being a part of this great perversion but they're creating another generational uh, idiocy and they're helping in, and they do it with finances. They do it with sickness and disease. Well, you know, uh, Johnny, a little, that's where daddy had his heart attack. That's where you'll have him. Nobody in our family ever lived past 45 and blah, blah, blah. You're creating another generation of lies and you're, you're, putting wrong thoughts in their minds and they're going to repeat it over and over. They're going to raise their children the same way. That's what poverty does. Poverty is a cyclical thing. It's demonic. It sucks the life out of people. And the only way that you're ever going to fix poverty is by preaching the gospel to them. That's it. That's what the Bible says. So if the gospel is hid, if it's not preached, it's hid to those that are lost the people that need it the most <laughs> in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those which believe not, lest the light, the power of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God should shine unto them. And when it shines, it illuminates and shows them the truth. And that is what's going to correct right and wrong thinking. Now, tomorrow... If you'll join me for tomorrow's Arkansas Live, we're going to start with the truth, the antidote of evil. Truth is the antidote for evil. Evil thoughts come, but the evil thoughts don't become sin until you imbibe them, take them, meditate on them, and act on them. But there's an antidote for all of this. It's called the truth. The knowledge of the truth makes you free. I'll see you tomorrow. Remember, Jesus is the Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas 72221 or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection. And follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.